Welcome, friends, to Disciples Net Church. We hope that this next period of time, about a half hour, will be spiritually uplifting to you. We'll have some scripture and some words by today's pastor. We'll have some music and we'll have some prayer. And at the end of our service, we will have communion. And we invite you now to get ready for that so that you can participate with us. Maybe some bread and some grape juice or wine or anything else you might have to simulate communion with the rest of us. We hope you'll join us and be with us and we want to extend that invitation to everybody and we hope that you will all feel welcome today. And now let us come to worship. Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 11 For surely I know the plan I have for you, says the Lord, plans for your welfare and not for harm, to give you a future with hope. Would you please join me now in prayer? Gracious and loving God, God of all creation, of majesty and mystery, we come before you in this moment, giving thanks for all that you are, and trembling, anxious to know you better and to follow your will for our lives. We pray, dear Lord, that you see each and every one who is humbly gathered here to worship even from such great distances in time and place and thought. Yet as we come before you now, each your beloved child, we lift our souls as one in your presence and sing your praise. Dear God, today we humbly ask for a portion of your vision, your wisdom, your power, your grace, 
so that we may respond as your servants to those in our midst who need so much for us to share your love. Dear God, we also bring before you our own needs, saying these to you now, even as you already know them. Please guide us in your paths and give us that sense of your peace that passes all understanding as we move forward. Some people listening here, dear God, may not know you. They may be seeking your presence, wanting to know you better. Some may be in great distress knowing that something in their life needs to change, that they are ready to surrender their lives to your will. We pray for them, dear Lord, and ask that you give them the reassurance they need, that you are and will be their God for now and all eternity, that you have sent your son Jesus to help show us the way to you. We thank you for hearing us, for accepting our feeble calls. Dear Lord, I am yours. Take me, guide me, use me as you will. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. And we ask now that you continue to hear our prayers together as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, My name is Susan McNeely. I'm an elder here at Disciples Net Church. And this morning I'm going to read the scripture from Genesis 18, verses 20 through 32. Then the Lord said, How great is the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah, and how very grave their sin. I must go down and see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry that has come to me. And if not, I will know. So the men turned from there and went toward Sodom while Abraham remained standing before the Lord. Then Abraham came near and said, Will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there are fifty righteous within the city. Will you then sweep away the place and not forgive it for the fifty righteous who are in it? 
Far be it from you to do such a thing, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous fare as the wicked. Far be that from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just? And the Lord said, If I find at Sodom fifty righteous in the city, I will forgive the whole place for their sake. Abraham answered, Let me take it upon myself to speak to the Lord, I who am but dust and ashes. Suppose five of the fifty righteous are lacking. Will you then destroy the whole city for the lack of five? And he said, I will not destroy it if I find forty-five there. And again he spoke to him. Suppose forty are found there. He answered, For the sake of forty, I will not do it. Then he said, Oh, do not let the Lord be angry if I speak. Suppose thirty are found there. He answered, I will not do it if I find thirty there. He said, Let me take it upon myself to speak to the Lord. Suppose twenty are found there. He answered, For the sake of twenty, I will not destroy it. Then he said, Oh, do not let the Lord be angry if I speak just once more. Suppose ten are found there. He answered, For the sake of ten, I will not destroy it. The word of God. Thanks be to God. Hello. We're glad you joined us at Disciples Net. I'm Russ Smith, the Senior Associate Pastor, and I'll be delivering your message for this week. What in the world is going on here? God is about to destroy the city of Sodom. And God has let Abraham in on the plan. And then Abraham says, in effect, God, are you sure you know what you're doing? What is Abraham thinking? Abraham even calls God the judge of all the earth. He must know that God knows what God is doing, and yet, here's the thing. God allows and even seems to encourage Abraham in his questions. Why? Some folks look at the way that Abraham talks to God and, and talks God down to ten righteous people and say, you know, it looks like God and Abraham are haggling over Sodom, like a buyer and a seller in the marketplace. Now, haggling is a time-honored tradition among the people in the Middle East, even today. Folks expect you to argue back and forth about the price of anything you buy. You'll argue that no one in their right mind would ever think to charge that much for this item. And the seller will argue back that you're trying to starve his children by paying such a meager amount. Back and forth, you argue until you arrive at a price that's mutually disagreeable to both of you. So, are Abraham and God haggling? Well, Abraham might think he's haggling, but God isn't. God is such a bad haggler in this scene. God never argues back. God simply agrees. Sure. For the sake of 50, 45, 40, 30, 20, even 10, I won't destroy the city. I think there's something here. I think it has to do with Abraham not completely understanding what's going on. But let's take a look further and see if we can figure it out. I want you to notice that Abraham uses the phrase, far be it from you. Now, a more literal translation of what Abraham says is, it would defile your very name to act in such a way. This is definitely the way someone would talk to a person in authority if you were trying to convince that person to do the right thing. And there's the problem. Why does God need to be convinced to do the right thing? There are some that propose that God already knew what God was going to do, and the only purpose of this exercise at all is for Abraham in his arguing to wrestle with what he thinks he knows about God. That may or may not be the case. But let's be clear, God does show profound love and patience with us 
by allowing and yes, even encouraging us to bring our questions and our concerns. It is an act of faith fueled by a burning desire to know more about God that drives us to question and to argue. Later on in the scripture, Job finds that God is big enough to endure all of our arguments. But I can't help observing that in all the time that Abraham is arguing, he never realizes he's asking the wrong question. He keeps talking like there are righteous people and there are unrighteous people. Yet, we know there really is no such thing as a truly righteous person, save Jesus himself. We hope to stand in God's presence out of the grace of Jesus that cleanses us from all our sin. So if we ask the question of Abraham, we almost always end up asking questions like, well, what did those folks do in order to deserve this calamity that has fallen upon them? And worse, worse than assuming that there is evil on the part of those for whom bad things happen, is the self-righteous assumption that we, who were not so afflicted, must therefore be somewhat more righteous than they are. So that brings us back again to that sense that Abraham really hasn't figured out what's going on here. Abraham might think he's haggling. He might think he's appealing to God's better nature. And that's because Abraham hasn't quite figured out God entirely yet. Now, you know what that means. That means that Abraham is a lot like the rest of us. I think one of the things that we believers do to get ourselves in trouble is to think that the people in the Bible have some complete understanding of God, and it's clear they don't. It's clear that just like us, they struggle with their faith. They try to work things out, and sometimes they get it wrong. That's actually one of the things I like about Scripture. I can identify with many of the people in the stories of our faith because they have to work it out. Because sometimes they do get it wrong. Abraham is an imperfect example. And when you are working with an imperfect example, you need to figure out what you should be following and what you shouldn't. Where the example gets it right and where they haven't got it right yet. Now here's where I think Abraham got it right. We need to raise our questions. We need to raise those questions knowing full well that at some later time we are going to be very embarrassed when we look back at the conversation. But also knowing that we would never get to where we're going without going through where we were. Like Abraham. We should trust that our sense of justice and mercy will grow out of conversations and, yes, even arguments with God. And like Abraham, we should trust in God's love for us and risk saying some really stupid things and risk making some stupid mistakes in order to figure out God and grow in our faith. We have a bit of an advantage because we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, including Abraham. We can learn what Abraham hasn't learned yet. We can learn from Ezekiel that God does not take any pleasure in the death of anyone. We can learn from Isaiah that not one of us is righteous. We can learn from Jonah that even the most evil of people can repent and turn back to God. We can learn from John that even though no one is righteous, God's mercy extends out to all people, including us. And as we talk with and even argue with God, God meets us where we are and uses our imperfect conversations to draw us closer. And as we grow closer to God, we also grow up in our understanding and in our likeness to God. All we need to do is stick with it.
long as I walk, let me walk close to thee. Just a closer walk with thee. Today we were asked a question, does God know what he was doing? When Pastor Russ asked that question, it made me think of God and Jesus and did God really know what God was doing when he sent Jesus to die for all of us? And the easy answer is yes. Because he loved us so much, he was willing to let us haggle all we want, knowing that in the end, love would prevail. We are at the table of love. We have been invited here to always remember the love and the forgiveness, the grace and the hope that comes from the life of Jesus Christ, his broken body, his shed blood, a gift given to us because we are loved so much by God. Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you for the gift of this table. We thank you for the elements that represent the life and the love through Jesus Christ. God, we pray that you would, even in this moment, cleanse our hearts, purify our minds, oh God, that we would be able to partake of such an awesome gift. Bless this bread near and far, oh God, that it might bring hope and healing and health to our bodies. And bless this cup, oh God, that it may cleanse us from all of our own unrighteousness. Let it bring us closer to you. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. It was on the night that our Lord was betrayed that he took bread and he blessed it and he broke it and said, This is my body which has been broken for you. Eat in remembrance of me. In the same manner he took the cup and he poured it saying, this is the blood of the new covenant poured out for the forgiveness of sin that as often as you drink this you do show forth my death and suffering until i come again
you may come to the table. And now, my friends, go out into that world, taking your part in that great cloud of imperfect witnesses, to share in the grace and mercy of a loving God, to call for justice, and to work out your faith with God, who is always listening and who is always with us in the midst of all of our struggles. Amen. When this troubled life is over, 